So in this video, we'll just take a closer look at this mini ITX server motherboard. This specific motherboard can be had very cheaply on eBay. Of course, it is used. So this one is the Gigabyte MJ11-EC1, and this is the proprietary one or the revision 1.0. So this used to be in a GPU server, but of course here on eBay, you just pick it out of the server and they sell the motherboard separately. And the price currently is 999 euros, but you can also make an offer for the seller. And I did get a little bit cheaper myself. I actually bought this specific version here that only had the four pin adapter that you can also see here, which you actually need to adapt to a ATX 24 pin to be able to use this with a standard ATX power supply. Or maybe you, you could adapt this to something else because it really only needs the five volt to run IPMI or BMC, so you can remote manage this motherboard and BIOS. But a few days after I actually bought this one here, they now had the exact same model with the ATX adapter, actually a little bit cheaper, and they are now in stock again. You can either get them from eBay, from Ram Koning, or you can also go to their website. I can, of course, link to the eBay listing down in the description below if you want to support the channel and also get this motherboard but it is a very inexpensive motherboard. It does have the AMD EPIC 3151. So that is a quad core 2.7 gigahertz. It also does have hyper threading, but you need to enable that in the BIOS because it is disabled by default. And like I said, it is a mini ITX motherboard. There is also a variant of this from Gigabyte. You just have the zero in the end. So same model number and it is revision 1.2, but this one here, it does have a PCI Express x16 slot here, instead of this slim SAS x8 slot or slim SAS 8i. So it is a little bit more consumer friendly. And I believe this one, you can also actually use the two other fan headers on the motherboard, or at least control them. But this one, they just run full speed all the time. You can only really control the CPU fan header. But other than that, I believe they are identical. But in this video, of course, we'll take a look at the non-zero variant, so revision 1.0. And the only physical difference is, of course, you do have that, like I said, times eight slim SAS port here, or slim SAS 8i. It can run in PCI Express times eight. You can unfortunately not bifurcate that or split that up in any ways inside the BIOS. Times eight is the only thing you have. It would have been nice to maybe split it up to two times four, for instance. So you can run two NVMe SSDs there and one NVMe SSD here as well. And we do also have a 4i slim SAS port as well. This is also PCI Express times four, but it can also be adapted to use four SATA ports. So you can actually run up to eight SATA ports from this motherboard, which is excellent. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to get this one here. But then of course we have that weird little plug here, which is not really standard for any motherboard where you kind of have to use this little cable here. Either you can get, like I said, this variant here where you can adapt it yourself, or you can get the ATX variant that already have the like ATX adapter included, which is much easier if you want to use it with an ATX power supply. But this little power cable is just for five volt and also to turn on, on the power supply. And also it gives the status that the power supply is turned on. So it's pretty easy to adapt actually. And also rem coning on the eBay listening, have a PDF file that will take you through how to actually adapt this. The AMD Apex CPU is embedded onto the motherboard, so it's not socketed. You cannot change that out, which is a little unfortunate, but considering everything is included, you get the cooler and everything for the price of the motherboard. I don't really think you can go wrong. I don't even think you can get a modern CPU or relatively modern CPU that can deliver this kind of power at 45 watt for that price point of the entire motherboard here. But of course you need to factor in the fact that you need several adapters if you wanna use either PCI Express or get some more SATA plugs on here as well. We do have four memory slots here. And this one I believe can actually run in eight channels, but you will then greatly reduce the transfers or mega transfers. And this motherboard does support registered DIMMs so R dims up to 2,666, but I believe it can only run at that full speed with one memory stick or one dim installed. If you install two dim to run dual channel, for instance, you're down to 2,400 and so on and so on. And it will get even lower in terms of speed if you install all four channels or if you saturate all four channels with memory. So if you want the fastest speed, you can only really use one, but two at 2,400 mega transfers is still fine, I think. And that is what I plan to use in this one here. Then you do have various plugs for server cases and for the specific 
server case that came with this one as well. And you also have the front I.O. pinout here, which is also in the instructions. So it's pretty easy to get, you know, HDD activity lights and power standby light and power on and so on, a power switch and reset switch. All of them are in these headers here. Then of course you do have that eight pin CPU power plug. This is 12 volt. The entire motherboard is powered from this little plug here. So there's no 24 pin on the motherboard at all. And the little pin over here or the little plug over here that supply five volt. I believe that's only really for IPMI or the little computer that is embedded on the motherboard where you can do like all the managing without the system even being turned on. On the back side, not really much. You do have two Intel NICs here, so that's pretty okay. These are only one gigabit though. That of course will limit the throughput. If you want to use this as a NAS server, especially if you have any SSD in your NAS server, Definitely you need to upgrade that one gig connection. You have power button here and you also have reset button and a lock switch here. And then we have USB 3.1 Gen 2, I believe they're called now. So five gigabits per second, USB A, and you only have really two of those. And then you have that ethernet plug here, which is tied to IPME or IPMI, as well as the VGA plug here, all tied into that little CPU or APU here, so that is a little computer inside a computer that most server grade motherboards have, where you can, of course, manage everything about the server and turn on and off the server as well. So if you need to get remote access or manage your server, you need to plug it in here. And VGA plug, this will just display whatever the screen is displaying on the motherboard. I actually tried to just run Ubuntu on here and the display port worked fine for that as well. But of course, limit your expectations because this is just a very small CPU slash GPU in this little chipset here. Then of course we have a little bit of cooling here and VRMs and we also have that times four PCI Express Gen 3 NVMe SSD slot here. So if you want to hook up an NVMe SSD, you can definitely do so with this board. Unfortunately, the second SlimSAS 8i port here is not saturated. It seems like it does have the components, at least the components that is nearby this plug here, but is not really installed by default. Maybe somebody with enough skill can actually try and install one of these and see if it will actually work. I definitely do not have enough skill to do so. We have a serial port header here as well, and also a USB 3 header on the motherboard. So you can hook it up to a front IO from uh, various cases and so on. The fans, like I said, only the CPU fan, so the default fan here is controllable inside the BIOS. These two fan headers here just run constantly at 12 volt which is a little bit unfortunate. The other variant of the motherboard, the revision 1.2. Inside the instruction for that motherboard, they actually talk about these two headers, but inside the instruction for this server, where this motherboard comes from, they only really talk about the CPU header. So maybe somebody can flash the firmware for the revision 1.2 motherboard and get these working. Not really sure if that's possible. Definitely above my skill set to cross flash any BIOS, but definitely would be nice to be able to control these two headers so you can have one for your fans and one for your hard drives. And you can just set those inside the BIOS to monitor the temperatures of those, of course. Then we have a pretty thick 40 millimeter fan. This is a very loud fan when it actually runs at 100%, which it does when you turn it on up until a point where it's actually starting up IPMI or BMC. But actually, if you manage this fan, it's not really all that bad. But I will probably just end up replacing that one with a Noctua fan in the future. And then we have a pretty beefy heatsink as well. Very industrial looking. You know, they just have this standoff screwed straight into the fan. A lot of vibrations as well. You could probably do that a little better, a bit better if you put some rubber gaskets underneath the fan just to stop some vibration. It does make a little bit of a noise when you actually, or actually when it's running. So let's just try and remove the heatsink. I've not removed the heatsink yet of this motherboard. I have several of these. I ended up buying like eight of these motherboards because it just was such a good deal. And I see myself using these in various different builds from NAS servers to media servers to yeah, little GPU rendering server, maybe even for some AI and stuff like that. You can build very small little computers with this one or maybe even for a light gaming PC or casual gaming PC, it would be okay, I think. So just four screws and underneath there, we do have a lot of very old thermal paste and this is of course the little embedded Ryzen Epic CPU. Let me just clean it up first. So of course, like I said, it is an embedded CPU, so we can't really replace it. But this is the 
original Zen architecture, so it is a little bit old nowadays. Still okay, I think, in a modern platform. It is a 45 watt TDP CPU. And for my testing, running this motherboard in a Jonsbo in 3 case with an 80 bronze power supply, nothing hooked up except for LAN. I'm idling at just around the 28-ish watt. That is definitely a little high, but it is also with SMT enabled, so hyperthreading, which is disabled by default, maybe because they want to preserve a little bit of power. So you can always go and just leave that disabled if they don't really need it, but kind of want to run a few containers and plugins and so on, maybe even a few virtual machines. So definitely the SMC or hyperthreading could help, help out there a little bit. But if you just wanted to use it as a raw NAS storage device, I don't really think you need SMC for that. They get a little bit closer here. So it is an exposed die, so definitely be a little bit careful. There's no like heat spreader covering the die, but it is pretty well protected because of this metal all the way around here. So very hard to actually damage it because it only sticks up just a nanometer above that metal rail all the way around there. But yeah, it is a fairly little CPU and it's also very easy to cool. So shouldn't really need all this fan really. You could pretty close to passively cool this CPU, I think. Or just throw a lower powered fan or lower RPM fan on there and have a little more quiet system. And yeah, you should probably consider replacing the thermal paste on these. It is kind of dry. It is still fine enough, but you could probably need a few degrees colder temperature if you actually replace it. So. That's what I tend to do on all of these motherboards I bought. So just use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. And I just like using these microfiber cloth, just the cheapest ones I can find. And then I tend to use these Q-chips just to go over it one more time with a little isopropyl alcohol on there. A little bit dirty, as you can see here, just from doing that. And the same with the CPU as well. Let's go through that one more time here. A little isopropyl alcohol. And... Then I just use a dry Q-tip just to get every little aspect of there. I use MX6, but you can use whatever you like. This is just so cheap. You can buy them these relatively big 8 grams tubes. So if you have multiple devices, it's definitely nice to have plenty of that. And it's better to use too much rather than too little of this thermal paste. Especially when you have an exposed die like this. And I tend to just want to spread it out a little bit here. Again, because I have an exposed die, it's very important that every aspect or every inch of this, or rather millimeter of this die here is actually covered in thermal paste, at least close to it, just like so. And then just put the little fan on here or heat sink. And I just like to cross tighten my things, especially stuff like this. A little bit at a time and Cross tighten is definitely the way to do it, in my opinion. And now it should be able to last the next six years without any issues. At least that's what Arctis is advertising, that this should, should last six years. And of course, remember to plug in the fan again. In terms of if you want to use a different CPU cooler on here, we're looking at around six centimeters of space in between the holes. And that's of course 60 millimeters. So maybe you can find a CPU cooler that actually fit on here. I just want to use the standard one because it is more than plenty. But yeah, six millimeter spacing between. And on the back side, we do have a metal bracket, of course, to screw into and a lot of little resistors underneath there. Would have been nice maybe to have a second M.2 slot on the bottom of the motherboard. But that's maybe a little bit much to ask for a super great motherboard like this. So I think that was pretty much it hardware wise. These tapes on top here, just because I want to cover the MAC addresses for the NICs on here. But of course, you can see the actual MAC address there. It's a little unfortunate that it doesn't have 10 gigabit NICs because the CPU actually do support 10 gigabit, but it definitely have been nice. So what I plan to do with my specific build, or the first build I'm going to do with these boards, is I am going to get a riser cable. So going from Slim SAS 8i into a PCI Express x16, of course only running x8 electrically. And then I want to connect a GPU to that, just a like Nvidia Quattro. GPU is what I'm planning. This is the P2000, so it's very slim, and it only really needs PCI Express power. And for the x4 M.2 NVMe SSD, I plan to use this as a x4 PCI Express. I use it with a riser or an adapter, so I can actually hook up a 10 gigabit NIC here. I'm not really sure if I should go SFP or just base T, but I have both on order. That is what I plan to do, and I have ordered all the adapters I need. And for the SlimSAS over here, next to the SATA port, 
I just plan to use this as four SATAs, so I can have eight SATA plugs connected to this motherboard, or eight SATA drives. So that means I'll get 10 gigabit networking, I'll get a NVIDIA GPU that I can use to encode or decode video, and I also get room for eight SATA hard drives. I can run, of course, standard mechanical drives or SSD or a combination of the two. I plan to run Unraid on here, at least for the two first servers I'm going to build, and I've already tried Unraid on the build I am in the middle of, and it works just fine. So I've already made this little nice adapter. I know, I know, it's beautiful. This is just to get IPMI up and running. Let's just do that now first. Plug it in, and then of course I have 5 volts going in to these cables here. And yeah, it is active, so let me just plug in the cables here, and we should see it booting up now. You can see the little LED starts flashing. Now it's just booting, and you can see it's flashing pattern there. Kind of need a network plug in here, and yeah, now it is still booting up, but you can see a different lighting pattern there. Turn off the light, but you can see the little IPME LED there will of course tell you what's wrong or what it is doing right now, even without you actually logging into any interface. But I think it actually is booted up now. Two slower flashes and one quick flash. Let's just go to the computer and try and log into IPMI or BMC. So of course to log into BMC or IPMI, you need to find the IP address of the motherboard. So go to your firewall or your router, just go to whatever DSPC server you have, and of course, find the IP address in mine. You can see up here, it's 119. To log into this, very easy. Username is admin, password is password. So that's what you need to log in, very e easy. And of course, you can go and replace those credentials, which is definitely something you should consider. So now we are logged in, and this is the dashboard you're met with. Currently, we don't really have anything going on here because the motherboard is turned off. Only the little CPU or little computer within the computer is actually turned on, so you can do some management. You can see up here in the left corner the actual firmware. We'll also try and update that in this video. So let's just go through all the menu points here. So we have the dashboard, we have sensors. Of course, none of the sensors are actually on, and a lot of the sensors are also tied to the case this motherboard originally came from. So you can see we have 10 GPUs and backplanes and so on as well. But you can really use this with this motherboard here. Underneath sensors, we have system inventory, and that will just take you through all the hardware of this computer. So you can see the CPU here. We can expand all of them and get the information about the CPU. So it is a Zen CPU. We do have maximum speed of 2.9 gigahertz, speed of 2.7 gigahertz, and we have four cores and eight threads as well. But again, we do need to go in and enable the threads inside the BIOS, and we'll also just take a look at that in this video. But of course, you can see all the information about all of the hardware connected to this motherboard. So on the memory, for instance, you can see it was at one point hooked up with a 16 gigabyte micron memory. See the serial number, the size, and so on. 16 gigabyte dual rank at 2,400 megatransfers per second. And you can also find the information about the PCI inventory, HDD inventory, and NIC inventory. But yeah, other than NIC, we don't really have anything connected. And these are the Intel i210 gigabit NICs inside. Not the highest end ones, but still okay. FRU information is where, of course, you will get all the information about the motherboard or the system. So you can see the manufacturer, uh, and also you can see the case for this motherboard as well. You can see the board product name, so it's the EC1-OT. Of course, you have serial numbers and so on and so on. Logs and reports is where you find any kind of log information, whether you turn on or off the system, or if you have any issues with some of your components, this is where it will turn up in the log. So you see the last log was actually eight months ago. So fairly recent, and I believe this motherboard came out in around 2021, 2022. But you can also see the system log, audit log, and video log as well. The video log saved. We do have an audit, and that's just me logging in here right now. Under settings is where, of course, you will have all of your settings, funny enough. But you can actually capture a blue screen of death. Pretty handy and useful. You can set, of course, date and time, and you can go down and set the time zone down here. And you can also set it to automatically use NTP to, of course, pull the date and time, which is definitely very handy as well. External user service. So you could, I guess, call 
gigabyte if you have any server issues with this board here. And of course, if you are a enterprise reliant of this server here, of course, you need to get very quick service. So yeah, I guess they have that baked into the motherboard. You also have KVM mouse setting. So you can set it up to these three different modes. Lock settings. So you can set up these two different lock policies. And you also have advanced lock settings here as well. Media redirection settings. So we have general settings, VM media, remote sessions, and active redirections. So remote media, I guess you could just hook it up to, yeah, a NAS server or a CD, DVD drive. Yeah, in the server world, they still use CD and DVD and VGA and serial ports and so on. Still not really that modern, but they don't really need it for what they actually use it for. We have VM media instance setting. Yeah, you can set up the parameters here up to four for each of these menu items. Remote sessions. And here you can actually go and set it for different keyboard languages. So yeah, we have a lot of the European languages. I live in Denmark, so this is what I'm going to use. And of course, you can hit save to save and active redirections, whatever that means. So yeah, you get an error here. The server encounters an error while getting media info. So I guess you need to be hooked up to the internet and to the servers or proper servers to use this. You get network settings here as well. So network IP settings, set up the network IP for the inbuilt NICs. And you can also create a bond. So if you want it to fail over, dedicated or shared. And you can also set up DNS here as well. PAM order, IPMI, LDAP, Active Directory and Radius. Uh -huh. Ah, okay, you can actually change the order of this. Not really sure what that is, but we have platform event filter. So you have the event filter. I guess you could press it and filter it out. And you can set up different informations here to yeah, whatever kind of filter you want to filter out. I guess if you have an event often from a sensor or something like that, that you don't really need to pay attention to, you can kind of filter that out. And these are just the predefined filters as well. Alert. So we have all these alert policies as well. And there is quite a few here by default. And then we have LAN destinations. And again, a lot of these by default set up here. Yeah, whatever that is, I'm not really sure. It's not really my expertise. You have services as well. So you have a web service, KVM, CD media. Okay, that's just the port for the different services. So of course, web is 80 or 443 and KVM and so on just have different port numbers and you can go and edit that if you would like to. No, I don't think you can actually change the port number, but you can change the timeout period. So yeah, if that's something you want to do. You can of course do that and you can also of course disable them. SMTP settings, I guess if you want a email notification when there is a new notification or when there's a new alert, you can be notified quickly through email. Definitely very handy. SSL, we also can of course upload a certificate so we don't get that annoying SSL warning every time we log into the server from a new browser. We have a system firewall. So we have basic uh, one touch settings here. So yeah, you do have a firewall you can enable or disable for whatever reason. I guess maybe if you have other servers hooked up to the same switch, you can kind of filter out some of that noise or some of the other servers trying to get into the server or whatever. So yeah, do have a firewall built in. Of course, we have basic, advanced and expert mode. And then you can go in here and make different rules and yeah, filter out whatever is trying to get into your server. You don't want to. User management, of course, this is where you will go in and change the password. So anonymous is disabled by default. You can go and enable that if you want. And we do have the admin here that we are actively logged in to. And if you want to change the password, you can just do so here, write a new password. And you can also change the username, I guess. So you can just create a new login, select a username and password, and set what privileges and what the user can actually access. So that's nice if multiple people have access to the server, you can create a user account for each of those and of course limit the ability of that user. So definitely usable. And how many can we actually have? I guess we can have 16 by default. This is just channel one. Okay, there was actually two channels. So I guess we could have 32 in total users spread over two channels. Not really sure why they actually made it like that. But yeah, anyways, we have video recording. So I guess if you want to find some errors or issues with the server, you can actually record, for instance, a startup screen and blue screen of data or whatever it is. But yeah, and also of course temperature and so on. You can kind of create a log and 
figure out what is wrong if there's something getting too hot or something not working properly could be a useful thing to actually video record the screen and of course you need to set up a remote server to actually record too because there's no storage at least not yet inside the motherboard and you can also set of course the video quality and the compression level and so on and so on that's kind of nice it could be very usable if you want to diagnose something have an issue with the server you don't really know what it is so you can just set a trigger here whenever the temperature it is at a certain point it will start to record the screen and you can kind of see if there's something actually happening or triggering that issue then we have the fan profile and you can actually go in here and create your own fan profile you cannot delete the default fan profile i recommend that you just copy this one and create your own because you cannot edit that either and it does have a pretty aggressive fan curve so it will run at 50 percent at its lowest point there's also this other profile so low profile rx guess that the previous owner made this profile and it's definitely more manageable so you can see here it does go down to 20 percent of the fan rpm you can select here what you actually are monitoring so this one is just monitoring all of the gpus and it's monitoring the temperature and it's just have this slope you can see here on the right side and initially it just run at 20 percent of its max fan rpm and then you could go down here to policy reference table and you can set different temperature and different fan rpm for that specific temperature so it's actually quite a nice little fan profile setter or system here we have in a server motherboard i remember like with my Super Micro mother motherboard I messed around with a few years back that we have to run scripts or edit like config files and so on. This one is so much easier because we have the all baked into the GUI and easy to make fan profile, but you also have all of those GPUs still thinking they're there, but they are really not because yeah, this motherboard comes from a GPU server. And you just need to remember to actually hit the little execute this profile button. If you don't do that, it won't execute and it won't run. You can only really have one active profile at the time but within that profile you can have multiple different policies so you can have policy zero one two three four five and each policy you can see here we have the gpus at one two we also have the gpus three we have the memory temps and four and so on so we can set multiple different instances up from each fan profile so you don't need to create a specific fan profile for the cpu and gpu and so on but with that being said, since this motherboard comes from a server that had a lot of GPUs and so on built in, that's really the only thing you can really monitor. So you can monitor the CPU, the memory, and the motherboard temps. That's the only thing you can really use. Rather than adjust the GPUs that are no longer here, HDD backplate, or backplane that's no longer in this motherboard, of course, because that's in the server. And I'm not really sure what the GROB8 and GROB9 is. And then we, of course, also have this PSU, but those you can't monitor either because yeah they are no longer here if you use your own PSU so only really those three temperature sensors you can actually set fan profiles accordingly I have not tried to plug in a GPU yet because I have not gotten the proper adapter so maybe if that turns up inside the BIOS maybe you can monitor that temperature sensor I'm not really sure but at least the default sensors here are no longer there for those GPUs and system fans as well which is another thing these system fans are the fans from the actual case it does have this power distribution board and also have fans plugged into that power distribution board and that is where these system fans come from so these system fans are not the system fans on the motherboard itself these system fans are from that case as well so you cannot monitor the system fans at all unfortunately only the cpu fan but that's also still pretty okay you can definitely create a good cpu fan profile for that specific cpu you don't really need to run this little fan there all that loudly or all that fast to cool that down sufficiently last one we have here is power consumption so you could kind of monitor the power consumption but i believe again you need those psus that come with the case you don't have those here but you can also have a platform power consumption limit but i believe again you can really use that in this scenario here then of course we have remote control where you can launch like the h5 viewer which is just the easiest one. We don't really have anything running right now. We only really have IPME. So yeah, you just get a black screen powered off. You can also do the J viewer, but you need to install something to actually use that. So I've not experienced anything with that, but you also have serial over LAN as well that you can activate and you can activate the identify LED. So with this one here, you can actually see whatever is going on on the screen remotely. So that's very nice. It is full KVM. So you can use your mouse and your keyboard inside this 
little screen there and you can see whatever is going on on the server screen. You can do this remotely, of course, wherever the server is, just as long as it is hooked up to the LAN connector, you can get directly access to this one here. And in here, of course, you do have various settings for video, for mouse, do also have options, you can actually zoom in. That's kind of nice because it can be a little bit small at times. We do have keyboard layouts here, send keys, hotkeys, you can add a hotkey, you can record the video, you can, of course, power on and off the server and so on, reboot it, and this is the active user, and you also have help here as well. So you can go up here and you can select browser file, and you can, of course, mount whatever kind of ISO. Let's just mount that word ISO here so the server can get access to that. I believe I'm not really sure how this works. You can, of course, start media. Also get a little warning notification here or what kind of notifications you have. The zoom level and you can also host display is locked at display and you can also turn on the server here. Then we have image redirection and I have no idea what that actually is, but I guess you can redirect some images remotely or have some remote media. Maybe it could be useful, I'm not sure. Then we have the power control. What you can do here is of course power on, power off, and that is powering on the motherboard itself or the entire server. You can do a power cycle, you can do a hard reset and you can do an ACPI shutdown. So you tell the software to actually proper shut down before you actually turn off the server. And then we have a maintenance mode here. So you can go and back up all your configurations. Definitely a good idea to do that. So if you mess up anything, you want to go back to the manufacturer default. You can do that. It does take a few seconds. And now it is ready to download. And you do get one of those BAK files. So let's just back this one up. Then we have firmware image location. So you can upload it or you can also have it from a TFTP server. Firmware information, of course, you can see the firmware is installed by default. It's from December 2020. So yeah, it is around three years old now, but three years is not really that old in a server world. Build date and so on. And you can see various other informations down here. Then we have the firmware update. And this is also where you can actually go and download the BIOS. Definitely recommend you go and do that as well. Nice to have a backup. For some reason, it's not letting me download the BIOS, but you can actually do that here. And this is also where you update the BIOS or update BMC. And we'll do that in a moment. First, let's just have a look at all the other settings. So we have prevent configuration. If there's any of the configurations you do not want over flash whenever you are updating the BIOS or the firmware, you can uh, just click whatever here. If you don't want it to disable the NTP server or HSH and for instance, all the settings you have for IPME and network, you can just click those and it won't reset or refresh those settings because it will probably just go back to default. Everything, if you flash the BIOS without actually checking any of these boxes. So that's definitely nice if you do not want to set all of these things up again. You can just check one of those boxes. You can restore configuration with just one of those BAK files. You can restore them here. So do a backup before a firmware update and you can restore it manually. That's definitely also one way of doing it. You can also do factory defaults. And this is, of course, where all of those preserved configurations over here on the left side. If you have enabled any of those, you will see a check mark there, but none of them are enabled. So when you click save here, it will reset everything to factory default, unless you, of course, go in here to the preserved co configuration that we took a look at before. And then we have system administrator, and you can set your password up here as well for that. Could be kind of useful. Up in the top here, we do have your notifications, your messages. You can select three different languages. You can also go into the BIOS, but this is a cut down version of the BIOS. You can click on sync. So you are in sync with your sensors and so on. You can also refresh this page. And of course you can go into admin here as well. Let's just go into BIOS. It's the same credentials for here as well. So admin as user and password as password. And this is a pretty stripped down version of the full-fledged BIOS, but you can go in and do some of the more common settings here. So you have the chipset here on the top, so you can select the training type, the program all VR, you can go in and set the error messages here as well. We have security, of course this is where you change the password. We have secure boot, you can go in and disable and enable that, that is definitely very nice. You have can do that here, so you don't have to go into the actual BIOS. You can also restore factory defaults and reset to setup mode and also go into your key management here so you can restore factory keys and so on and so on. You can of course save and exit if you have any changes. Of course you need to 
Save it before exiting. Advanced, you have trusted computing. You can enable and disable all of those settings related to that here as well. CPU configuration, so you can enable or disable SVM, which is CPU virtualization, and SMEE, which is Control Secure Memory Encryption Enabled. And note zero information, yeah, there's no information there. PSI subsystem settings, so you can set some of the PCI devices here. So for instance, you can enable or disable the LAN controller, LAN 1, LAN 2. You can also set above 4G decoding, SRIOV support. If your PCI Express devices support that, you can of course enable that. It's disabled by default. You can also control the U2-2, U2-2 IO ROM. Then you have USB configuration, pretty basic setup here, and networking stack configuration here as well. And then we have the chipset. So PCI link training type, one step, two step. Let me know down in the comments if you know what that is, but then we have other settings here as well. That's all for chipset. Boot, again, very nice. You can go in here and set the boot order. So you can boot directly from a USB device, for instance, if you want to boot on RAID on here, like I want to do, just set this to USB and you can even disable the rest of the boot options, which is definitely something I'm going to do in the future. You can enable or disable choir boot. And then we have server management and you can see those settings here. System event log as well. So that's all the stuff you can do from the cut down version of the BIOS. Most of the stuff you probably need is in here. But for instance, if you want to enable hyper threading, you need to go into the proper BIOS and there's also a lot more settings you can do from there. But it's definitely very nice to have this very easy to get into BIOS. First off, I want to just show you the BIOS update. So there are several firmware updates for this motherboard, but it's not really on the website. I found most of them or all of them of a forum called Surf the Home. I can link to that forum post down in the description below. You can find links to these BIOSes there. So the BIOS I want to flash on here is the 126117, which is the latest BIOS, at least that I've been able to find. I believe it's from November 2023. So it is very recent. I'm recording this as of January 2024. So you just need to select the rom.emi underscore enc file. Click on that. Start firmware update. Just let it process the file. You don't really need to do anything here. Don't need to access any of the drop down menus. Doesn't really work only with other file types. Just select BMC and you can see all of the stuff we went through before. If you want to prevent it from overriding any of these configurations, you can do that also inside of the maintenance settings. But if you don't want to preserve that, you can just go to proceed to flash. Else, of course, you can go in and edit that preserve configuration list. I just want to override everything because I want to start completely fresh with the latest BIOS. Then you get this propped up message asking you if you will start the firmware upgrade now. You will not be able to access the BMC until it flashes and restarts. Do you want to continue? Just click OK. Just let it process because first off, it will just upload the file. Once it's uploading, it will tell you what it will actually update. And only from there, it will go to on with the actual updating. It is a fairly long process, so definitely you need to have some patience here. And of course, make sure you don't turn off the motherboard and so on. Same as with any other firmware updates or BIOS updates, you should be very cautious and very patient as well. So let it just upload the flash file and let's get back with the actual update. So now the firmware file, you see it's uploading 100% down here. And you can see here throughout the list what it is actually updating. So the config will be the same. Both of the first two configs here, it will update the EC to a newer version, root the same, OSC image also the same, as well as the DRE, www, and what is it, test tabs, same version. But you can see down here, it will actually update the firmware from 1249.06 to 1261.17. So what you need to do only is just to click flash and Again, you get a little pop-up message here. Clicking OK will start the actual upgrade operation where the storage is written with the new firmware image. It is essential that the upgrade operation is not interrupted once it starts. Do you wish to proceed? Just click OK. And you can see there, it immediately gets into the flashing phase. So it's a two-step operation. It now it's flashing. Once that's up to 100%, you're actually done. Of course, the motherboard needs to reboot and so on. And you should have the latest and greatest installed and also all of the settings of the motherboard should be back to 
default. So let's just let it run and get back once it's done. So after some time, firmware image has been updated successfully. Click OK. You get a second pop up here. That firmware reset has been called. Close all current session and open new session after a couple of minutes. So of course the motherboard just needs to reset the BIOS and you can log back into it after a few minutes. And now the firmware update is finished. You can see the new firmware version up here, 12.61.17. If you go down under maintenance, you can also go in here and check the firmware update. And now it is up to November the 1st, 2023. So a little bit newer, a few years newer actually. And you also get build time and firmware version again. So let's actually try and put some power into this small board here and boot it up and just go through the real and abstract BIOS. And also so you can hear the fan noise coming from this motherboard with the default fan profile. So now the motherboard is turned on and it is around the 50% RPM for the fan right now, which is the default lowest it can go. You can actually turn that down a little bit lower. So let's just go down to 25%. You can hear the noise floor there. And you see we're pulling around the 40 watt here. So now we're down to like the lowest we can go with this little fan. You can hear it does have a little bit of vibration noise. It's also just strapped on there with two screws. You can probably do a little bit better job leaving a proper mount for this fan. But I think this is definitely manageable and if you want to use it in a NAS enclosure with a lot of disk spinning, you won't really hear this fan unless of course it is running at its maximum RPM. Let's just get into the BIOS and enable hyperthreading and also just go through some of the menu items we have there. So now let's just have a look at the BIOS. Do we get any information here about the board? This is just the main page. So we can see the BIOS version that we just updated. Model number of the motherboard. We have eight gigabytes of memory installed. Let's move over to the advanced. So first off, let's just enable hyperthreading. You need to go down to the AMD CBS settings are down here. Go into send common options and then go down here where it says core slash thread enablement. And then you have to agree here as well. And from there you can enable SMT or hyperthreading. So it's disabled by default. Just go down and set it to enabled. Now you're good to go. And now you have the eight threads as well as the four cores or eight thread that can work in conjunction with the four cores can help out a little bit in multi-core operations, but will of course use a little bit more power. Maybe that's why they have disabled that inside the BIOS. But else, let's just start from the top. We have trusted computing. Of course, we do also have that in the easier version of the BIOS we took a look at earlier. So you can enable and disable all related to the TPM on the motherboard or on the CPU. PSP firmware version. I'm not really sure what that is, but you can see the version of that here, AST2500, that is of course EPMI or IPMI, the little onboard computer that can control and manage everything here. And you can go into the super IO configuration, you can really do much here. You can enable or disable the serial port. It is enabled by default as well. We have S5 RTC wake settings, so you can enable or disable the wake on alarm. It is disabled by default, serial configuration here as well. If you want to use that, of course, still used in the server world CPU configuration. Those settings we also had like in the easier BIOS, but you can see you can have that virtualization and also control the memory encryption enabled. And you can go in here and see a little bit information about the node. Now you can see we have the four core, four threads. But once we save this BIOS, because we just made that change before, we will go up to a thread. We have PCI subsystem settings. Again, we could also do those in the easier version of the BIOS or the nice GUI BIOS, but we have the same settings here. Of course, enable, disable, LAN, and so on. USB configuration, same settings as in the other version of the BIOS or other layer of the BIOS. You can enable and disable all of those settings. Network stack configuration. If you want to enable IPv4 and IPv6, enable or disable that here. NVMe configuration, if you have an NVMe installed in the M.2 slot, you can see that here. And then we have the SATA configuration. Of course, you can see all of the SATA drives you have installed here. We do not have any hardware RAID or anything like that on this motherboard. This is just purely for information. You can see what is plugged in there. And SATA controller is the onboard SATA controller with this onboard SATA plug. The SLSAS is the SlimSAS 4i that you can, of course, plug in an adapter to adapt to four SATA plugs. 
and you can of course see eight in total. We can run from this little motherboard, which is definitely excellent. AMD, CBS, of course, all settings related to AMD. Every settings from what we just went into before to enable hyperthreading. You can have DF common settings or common options. I uh, guess is what is memory related. You could find in here. Again, some more memory configuration. You can enable DRAM timings and so on. Not something I am personally going to mess around with, but it's here if that's something you like to mess around with. And memory impist or motherboard installer or whatever it is. I don't know, but you can actually dive pretty deep into all of these settings related to the CPU. And you can also go in here and enable or disable the fan control to either auto or manual. Auto, I believe, is just tied to IPMI. NB configurations. If you want to have IMMU enabled, you can go in here and enable, enable that. And hot plug flex. Yeah, there's just so many settings. I don't know what like 90% of these settings are. This, of course, SATA controller. If you want to enable, disable the SATA controller. Uh, I guess the SATA controller is inside the CPU. You can have SATA RAS support, SATA disabled ACPI, HCI, excuse me. And we have sleep error report here. USB configuration options, secure digital options. I guess you can get a SD card reader or something like that for this motherboard or for a variant of this motherboard. I2C, UART configurations. Ah, okay, so you can have your legacy here and yeah, so on ESPI configurations, EMMC options. Yeah, there's just so many settings here. And the XGBE controller. And this is the 10 gig lane that we don't have enabled, unfortunately, or installed. Would have been nice if we could get some 10 gig controllers, but if it was an AMD controller or network controller, maybe it's not really that well supported in various operating systems. NTB common options. Uh-huh, 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 you can, okay, either auto or disable or enable, rather. So that's all related to AMD CBS. We have iSCSI configuration. We have T1S authentication. Uh, this is the certification for the server. Of course, we have the Intel NIC built-in configurations here as well. You can even set VLAN up here, which is kind of nice if you are running VLAN, of course. On your network you want to hook it up to that you can do so here and so on and so on let's go over to the chipset menu not really a lot of information here you can have pci link training type either one step or two step i have no idea what that is program all vr north bridge okay so this is the memory we have installed in there running through the north bridge apparently and we have the error management here as well so that's all for the chipset Server management, of course, see all of the settings here. And we also have a system event log. View FRU information. So information about the motherboard. And the case also, it came in. BMC network configuration, of course, for BMC slash IPMI. And we have the IPVC BMC network configuration. Same as the other one, I guess. Just for IP version 6. Security. You can have an administrator password and you can have a user password and you can also enable and disable secure boot. But yeah, you can also do that in the GUI version of the BIOS. Reset factory keys and so on. Of course, disable secure boot if you want to use anything but Windows or another operating system that requires that or take advantage of that rather. And we have boot options here. All of the settings again we had in the easier BIOS we also have here. So set the boot orientation and so on. If you want to boot from USB devices first, it's definitely what I'm going to do. And then the last one we have, of course, is save and exit. So you can save the BIOS and you can discard changes and so on. Restore default and boot override. You can boot from network connection and launch EFI shell from file system device. It's a fairly easy BIOS, but definitely these AMD CPS settings, you have a lot of different settings there. I don't know what 90% of those are, but other than that, it is a very familiar American megatrend BIOS. So let's just save this and exit. So now we have hyperthreading and so on enabled. And that's pretty much all I am going to set up as of now. So that was just a hardware and software overlook of this little mini ITX motherboard that you can have right now very inexpensively on eBay. I definitely would recommend it. But of course, just note 
those limitations you have with this board. It is a model board that is pulled from another server, so it's kind of configured to function with that case. For instance, like the fan headers here for the system fans, doesn't really work or you can't really control those. You have this like little bit odd connection, like Slim says, 8i, it's a little bit harder to get accessories, not really impossible, not really that expensive. You can get little daughter boards that you can actually hook up other PCI Express devices, but again, this is also an extra expense. If you get the version with the four pin connector, you also have to make an adapter for this to work. There's also maybe another expense, unless you, of course you have the proper cables already lying around. But overall, I think this is a fantastic value, especially if you wanna run eight SATA drives. There are not really that many, if any motherboards that come with that configuration already installed. By default, of course, you need to still get, go out and get an adapter cable, not really that expensive and you can run eight SATA drives over this motherboard. Would have been nice to see a 10 gig connection built in, but again, for this price point, you can't really complain. Even if you could live with just one gig, or you can also link aggregate these two together to get two gig connection, that's probably fine for a lot of folks out there. And also factoring in the low price, it is a definitely go ahead in my opinion. I, like I said, went out and got like eight of these boards. First, I just got two, and I thought maybe it wouldn't be nice to just have an extra spare or maybe two extra spares lying around because I wanted to build two servers originally. And a few days after that, they had the version with the 24 pin adapter for sale. I was considering just sending these ones back, but I think I will actually find some systems. I can use them in pretty easily and you can build very small form factor systems with this. So definitely highly recommend it, but just note those shortcomings. A very good place for information is the Surf the Home thread that I've been reading. A lot of great information there. You can get new bias updates and people have tried several things like flashing the bias from the revision 1.2 on this motherboard and so on. You can get a lot of good information there. And also you can find the instructions for this motherboard online as well. And I actually already started building my Jonspo N3 server. We have another motherboard in here already hooked up. I'm just waiting for the adapter so I can get a GPU and also a 10 gig NIC in here. But so far I've been very impressed by this little motherboard. It is not the most power efficient out there. So we are looking at around 30 watt just idling with two memory sticks hooked into a ATX power supply with 80 plus bronze ratings. So it's not the most efficient out there. Maybe there's some settings in the BIOS I've overlooked because like you saw, there was just so many settings in the BIOS, especially for the CPU. Maybe there's some power settings there you can enable and so on. But 2080 watt, I think it's definitely still okay. But once you start to add a networking card or a GPU, you're probably closer to like 40 watt, maybe even 45 or 50 watt, just for the motherboard operation. And that is just idling. Of course, it doesn't really suck that much power when it's on for full load. I believe about 70 watt or so, but still that is not the most efficient out there, but definitely not the worst ones either. But anyways, if you're interested in this motherboard, I can share some affiliate link down in the description below. But that's pretty much all I have for this video. Hope to see you again in a future one. Until then, take care.